All right, we've got another excellent interview for you guys. Now, we almost never uh, interview a person uh, two times. Now, there's a reason for this, because there's something new out here, and I'm positive you're not going to mind. Oliver Stone is back. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know that you didn't have anybody else back. <laughs> they were that bad. Huh? No, 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 because generally, we, Oliver, we do the interviews where, you know, I ask about your life as I did last time and, you know, your career and et cetera, and then we talk about your project, right? right. Now, we've, we've already done that with you, although there's no end to talking about right. your career. Right. And if, if you've I lived in... I change the story all the time. Though. Right. <laughs> and if you've lived in a cave for the last, you know, uh, 30 years or so, you might not know that Oliver Stone was the director of JFK, Born on the Fourth of July, Wall Street, Platoon, and about 78 other excellent movies. But, you know, every time we have you on, I uh, find out something new. Like last time, I was surprised. I didn't know that you had written Scarface. Mm. I, I had no idea. When I saw that, I was like, wow, that's really interesting. Yeah. And this time, I learned that you were the producer of The People vs. Larry Flint. Mm. That's a, a great, a phenomenal movie. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I thought Woody Harrelson did a great job. First Amendment movie. That's right. And it didn't do as well as we'd hoped. We got the, there was no, uh, it never had turned a profit, but it was, I'm very proud of the movie. And Courtney Love was great too in it. Yeah, she was brilliant in it. It was, uh, I was shocked by it, to be honest. And, uh, and, but you know, it's one of those movies that whenever I mention to movie buffs, People versus Larry Flint, they always say, oh, that's a great movie. Yeah. So, uh, so that's that's terrific. As a director, producer, and writer, obviously involved in some of the biggest movies, literally in history. So now, uh, untold history of the United States is what we talked about last time. Now, Again? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's too long. You haven't seen all twelve chapters. Last yeah. Time. Well, last time we'd only seen ten chapters. Uh, two new chapters are out there, prologues. So they cover uh, from you know they cover World War One and the lead up to World War Two, right. more Great Depression, etc. They're now out on Blu-ray. You can download them. Uh, the paperback version of the book is also out. Mm -hmm. So and uh, and I look, I watched the whole thing, right? And I've got 120 questions for you, so <laughs> we we got to get started. Okay. Amazon, Costco, Target, Walmart, mm -hmm. pretty much, and iTunes. I think just today or yesterday. So perfect. Uh, it's out there for everybody who wants to watch it. So now watch it with your girlfriend, don't you think? Mm -hmm. I think you should watch three hours at a, at a time because I think that you get into a fever and then I think romance comes with it and then you go back a yeah, you know, weekend. Absolutely. You're like, oh, Woodrow Wilson, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and it gets, you know, and then you start talking about Smedley Butler, and, uh, and which is a guy I want to talk about with you in a second. And, and the girls love Smedley. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. but, but you know, the funny thing is your, the, your voice became entrancing after a while, because I watched 12 hours of it, right? And, and I got to the point where I associated your voice with history like I'd, I did with the, you know, the guy that was called the Voice of God for, that did the voice of NFL wow. films. So whenever you watch an old football clip, you, you expect his voice. Wow. Now whenever I watch anything related to history, I expect your voice to come in. <laughs> That's and so sweet of you. And, and I'm wow. like, okay, Oliver, tell me all about no, it. That's so kind. You would <laughs> Well, you're you're an old radio man, right? I yes, think, that's uh, right. You're a sports man too. I think you did. Yeah, I love sports. I did a little bit yeah, of sports you have a for a great while. Voice too. You know? Oh, thank you. I appreciate no, it. I, it. But it's the it's I, uh, my model for the series was um, the World at War, 1970s BBC. That was uh, Laurence Olivier, who a um, uh, great voice, was doing this 25 hours and all about World War II from the British perspective, of course. But mm -hmm. it was a beautiful series, and I wanted to make something. So I put myself in as a temp track because we have to cut the thing to a, a pace. And we had 58 minutes and 30 seconds per episode. So right. to help pace it along, I did the voice temp track, and everyone started to like it, like, like you're saying. So not everybody, but right. we left it in instead of going after an actor, which is what you normally would do, hire an actor to do the whole thing. No, no, I, I thought your narration of it w was spot on in terms of the, the mood. Because you, you look, any project is, that is much more likely to be successful if someone's passionate about it. And you could tell as you're telling the story that you were passionate about it. And, you know, I saw that you got a, a criticism because it's called untold history of the United States. And somebody was saying, well, you know, well, we knew some of that. Really? I mean, so yes, of course, if you know history, you know some of it. But was it highlighted? It certainly wasn't highlighted in a lot of the history that we read in civics class when we were in, in school, etc. Like, I remember from the first 10 that, you know, that took us from World War II all the way through to the present, I was telling you earlier, S Stalingrad, you know, mm -hmm. I, I knew the importance of that, generally speaking, to World War II. But I didn't know the depth 
of what had happened yeah, there. That's and, as, and as you watch it, you think, my God, the enormous willpower yeah. of those people. When, when everyone else gave in to the Germans, because yeah. it seemed like you couldn't win, Stalingrad, the, the citizens of Stalingrad proved <laughs> that if you actually have willpower and you stand up <laughs> almost to the devil in, in that case, right, that you could even beat the devil. That's true, and it was the uh, turning point of World War II, no question about it. It was the first time, they, well, at Moscow, they, they turned back the Germans, but it wasn't the same thing as Stalingrad. That was a, the, the Germans threw everything they had at that, the Pal General Paulus and his Sixth Army. And the Soviets took enormous casualties, civilian and, and military. Drove them back, took two and a half months. It was in January of 43 when that, when that happened, finally. And that was exactly the turning point in the war, because from that point on, Churchill and Roosevelt, they knew that things had changed. Before, everybody was running from the Germans. After that, slowly, slowly. It took many more battles in the Soviet Union, Kursk, the tank battle. And the, but the, the Russians peeled back the Soviets, I mean, the Germans, inch by inch over that. Millions of men were killed. The German army was chewed up in Eastern Europe. Uh, I think it was six million uh, Germans were killed over there, one million on the Western Front, that kind of enormity as you describe it. And President Kennedy was the, after Roosevelt, was the first American president to acknowledge that what you just said about the Soviet sacrifice of, uh, during World War II. He was the first one in 1963, just before he died. So I'm confounded by people who don't find history interesting. I, I, it's the most interesting thing in the no. world. So, you know, I, I know we talked about the, the f first 10 last time, so yeah. I want to concentrate a little Not bit more on the. Uh, we, yeah, I mean, it's complicated. Of course, it's a very, very, you know, long period of yeah. time to, to get delve into. I want to talk about the prologue a little bit that just came out as, mm. as part of the DVD. Mm. Uh, and, and, and it's the same themes, which is that it's. History is nuanced and complicated and. And so Woodrow Wilson, in some ways, was headed in the right direction, and then boy, does he take a wrong turn, and 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 it's not it's it's not a black and white issue. As I as I look at Woodrow Wilson and and how he got into World War One, uh, I feel like it's opportunities lost in a lot of ways. And as and watching the whole thing, as you see history unfold before your eyes, American history, world history, constantly the theme I get from untold history of the United States is opportunity lost. Yeah, the loss, the lost is the key word, tragedy. There is the road not taken. And I think the, the history series is done with love. I mean, the sense that it's a country that I loved very much when I was young, and I have to, at my age, I wonder what the hell happened, you know? And you're going back to, where did we go wrong? And in 1900, we start 1900 with McKinley and Bryant election, which is about imperialism abroad. And McKinley wins, of course, Republican. But with Wilson, it's an interesting story because he was a Democrat and a reformist Democrat. He did a lot of good things. However, his entry into World War I is a questionable, it has to be re-examined because World War I was about empire uh, between the, the rush, between the French and the German empire and the, and the English empire, which is the dominant empire in the world. And it lasted, the British empire is, is like us now. They controlled everything, the sea lanes, and the Germans were coming on and were beating them in a lot of ways. So there was a tremendous rivalry, but it was a, a petty war the way it began. And it didn't have to be. Barbara Tuckman wrote about that. But Wilson got sucked into it. Partly of a lot, we believe, and we showed it, the Morgan Bank uh, had a huge loans out to England, were very minor loans to Germany. And though that banking element sucked us in towards the British sector more and more until Wilson basically run on the ticket of not, not going into war for his second term in 1916, actually went and was very aggressive in uh, prosecuting the war. We made the difference in World War I, but we couldn't control the Europeans from cutting up the world once again and going back to their imperialism and colonialism, their control over the, the third world countries, which is what it was about if we were a democracy and, and, and believed truly in freedom. But Wilson had a racist element to him, as you know from mm -hmm. him, not only with the blacks in America, but abroad. He, he ignored uh, Africans, he ignored Asians, he ignored the small guys. Anyway. So the, the moneyed interest is what was fascinating yeah, to me. Yeah, the money. 
it, because that getting drives... Getting the loan back, getting the money back right. from England. And when, it, and when they couldn't pay, we made sure that Germany gave the money to England and France so that, and they'd give it back to us. See, for example, I mean, that's the exact uh, perfect example of the untold history, right? Because we were told that, yes, after the World War I, we crushed the Germans too much, right? And that led to a backlash, that led to Hitler. So we knew that part, right? But what we certainly weren't told was that part of the reason we crushed the Germans and demanded so much money from them was because the American bankers had lent the money to the British and the British wanted it from the Germans since they had won so they could repay the American bankers. That part we didn't get told. And, mm -hmm. and so to what degree do you think that, is the that was a determinative factor into getting into World War I and what we did in terms of you know, the, the Germans and extracting the money there. And if so, how does that work? That, see, that was my curiosity. I mean, they don't go to Wilson and say, hey, we'll give you money, right? I don't imagine. How do the bankers get Wilson to do everything they want, if that's the case? Well, I don't know. I'm not sure it works like that. I think right. that there's pressures. And I think that Wilson, I mean, Wilson was divided because America was half German. So he had a lot of voters there that he mm -hmm. couldn't go to war against Germany. He had to provoke it. So we had things like the Lusitania, which was lied about at first, very much like the Tonkin Gulf Resolution. And th we, they said we had no arms on board, but there were arms going to England. One thing after another, Bryant tried to stay out of the war. He was Secretary of State, but Wilson definitely wanted to go in. Uh, and the, you know, the the Dawes, com uh, the uh, the uh, not the Dawes Committee in 19 uh, in the 1930s, uh, the. Uh, I forgot the name now. Jesus, it's too many facts. But they investigated the mm -hmm. profiteering from World War One. It was a huge issue in the United States in 1930s, and they found that these people had profiteered. So there were suggestions about an income tax on the on the uh, profiteer war profiteers of about 98 percent. Never came to be because at that point we were facing the pressures of fascism in World War Two. So the America. Uh, unfortunately, we never really dealt with it because people made money in World War II, too, as you know. There was a lot of labor strikes, so there was a lot of issues of money all throughout that war. But the United States basically entered into a new world after World War I. We became a world player, not, uh, not the dominant one. We were the richest one, but England remained the dominant player. And if we looked at the map you saw in Chapter 2 about the British Empire that goes all the way to Singapore, India, Suez, uh, Greece, that becomes the real playground. The British are trying, Winston Churchill is trying to preserve the British Empire. And he goes to great lengths to do it. And we, as a result, it's the Russians who fight the Germans on the Eastern Front, do the most of the fighting, because Churchill is busy trying to keep hold of the, the Balkans and trying to get back into his British Empire in the East. Very interesting story ge geopolitically. The US, Roosevelt is suspicious of Churchill and, and very divided. And, he's, and, he, and, he, and he puts out a warm hand to Stalin. Uh, they, there is a, a relationship, an alliance between us and the Soviet Union. The moment that Roosevelt dies, Churchill's working hard to change the, uh, to change the alliance. And he gets Truman, who's a small, narrow-minded man, I think, and not, a, not a, a bad man, but certainly narrow-minded. You know, I would argue the, he's a bad guy. Uh, to after fall into the British course. camp and take this very strong anti-Soviet stance two weeks after the war. Two weeks, a, I mean, two weeks after Roosevelt dies. Two weeks, he's insulting the Russian ambassador. Uh, for foreign minister. By the time uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki roll around, I mean, this is what we don't learn in school. I mean, there are three things you don't learn. One is that the Japanese economy was devastated, devastated by the war. People wanted to surrender. They were starving. The transportation facilities, ports, most everything was destroyed. Number two, that the Japanese wanted to surrender. And Truman knew this. The codes, we'd broken their codes. We knew they were sending cables to the Japanese ambassador in Moscow and saying this and this. They were looking for terms from the Russians or trying to make a deal with them. And three, what people in America don't ever learn is that the Soviets invaded Japan in Manchuria and destroyed the Kwangtung army. Uh, on August 9, which is the th when the second bomb was dropped, and the Japanese were terrified of the Russians. That was what was scared them, was the, had the most impact on them for surrender because they'd already been bombed by us to, to smithereens, so they didn't really know the big difference between an atomic bomb and a firebombing of Tokyo. All these factors that we don't really learn in school, so we're not making informed judgments, but we did not have to use the atomic bomb. We used it because we built it, because we spent a fortune doing it, and we wanted to see if it worked. Right, and we wanted, and we to, send wanted a message. to send a message to the Soviets, more than the Japanese, who were finished, that you better not screw around in the Far East. We're, we're, right. we're the boss now, and uh, Truman played it that way. A, a quick aside there, because I want to get back to the moneyed interest, but uh, Truman, uh, after watching the series, comes across to me, or came across to me, 
as uh, George W. Bush. I agree with you totally. We made that illusion because, and that's when my, see I didn't know much of this history uh, either when I was uh, younger and when Bush said uh, that he admired Truman more than any other president of that previous century, next to Reagan maybe, I, my alarms went off and I said, there must be something wrong with <laughs> right. Truman. Right. No, because it, Truman see, comes across as a really simple guy, simple-minded, easily swayed by the, the more conservative yeah. right-wing forces in his government. Anti-Soviet forces. Right. And, and wants to prove himself full of bluster, insecure in, in reality, is not sure he's up to the job. Yeah. So, and, and you see it, you see it in coaches, whether it's football, basketball, you see it in presidents yeah, sometimes. Yeah. People who don't have real inner strength yeah. go out of their way to to fake strength yeah. by by attacking, punching, bullying, etc. And you saw that in yeah. Truman. I think you see it in George W. Bush. But you know, go back to Wilson because Wilson was a strong man. He was center. He had a strong center. He, mm -hmm. he took on that League of Nations. He fought to the death for it. Right. But uh, he had the. Uh, op he also hated the, the communism and made a big point. Uh, he didn't like Lenin. He thought Lenin was. Uh, an anarchist, a revolutionary, and it would change the world. He was most scared of the communists taking over the labor unions in the United States and the, and the labor strikes all from Seattle to Boston. Even the, the Boston police, I think, went out in 1919. There were the raids, the, red ra the Palmer raids that Wilson sent. He broke all the laws of, 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 that the United States was supposed to stand for. So there was these vigilante roundups of, of communist uh, labor agitators, a, a, People like uh, Big Bill Haywood, Emma Goldman, they were sent, they were deported. There was a, but there was a real labor movement back then, and the country, yeah. in so many ways, was more progressive. And 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 so I felt like whether it was Wilson or or ensuing presidents, they had to hold labor back by giving them some of the things that they wanted, uh, even if it wasn't necessarily what they wanted to do. Yeah. Whereas like now we don't have that countervailing influence. Yeah. So. Obama, who I don't believe is a progressive at all, but d doesn't really have anyone on his left that he's got to contend with anyway. Yeah. So then he says, all right, well, I mean, the only yeah. force I have are the bankers and the corporate CEOs. Right, right, exactly, you have it. Except he said, you know, I, you have to put pressure on me. Does he keep saying that? I mean, But he doesn't mean it. He doesn't seem to respond to that. You know, he <laughs> yeah. talks about, I'm not eavesdropping on you, and <laughs> we're going to look into this, and he reassures France, and he reassures Brazil, but it's... It sounds so hypocritical to me, and I don't think these countries believe him either. So, to, to go back to this idea of, of the, the bankers pushing us into World War I, yeah. so, I as I watched the whole 12 parts, again, one of the, the themes that it, it popped out at me, obviously, uh, and I don't know that you intended it, but this is what I got out of it, is that American interests, and as a kid, you think American interest means the interests of the citizens of the United States of America. But what they really meant by American interests was business interests. Yeah. And so well, the coups that we did uh, uh, were for so-called American business interests, yes. right? So then I really came to the conclusion at, at some point, I don't know if it was number seven or number eight in the series, <laughs> that, oh my God, the CIA didn't work for us. Uh, you know, now what it is is an interesting question as yeah. well. But certainly back then, it didn't work for us at all. It worked for corporations. Yeah. And then in this prologue, when you go from 1900 to, to right. the beginning of World War II, you see Smedley Butler, and he says it, right. right? So now I'm positive that most people don't know who Smedley Butler is. So okay. tell us who he is and how that relates to this. He was one of the, uh, the most decorated uh, Marine general, uh, I think two medals of honor, two or maybe. And uh, he was, was uh, in seven or eight countries from China to Nicaragua to Honduras. He was a hero. He fought in these limited battles, but he fought the Boxer Rebellion in 1899. So, mm -hmm. you know, and that he woke up one day and he basically started to, f he realized that he was serving the interests of Brown Brothers Harriman and Standard Oil of that time. And he felt very, he started to feel very bad about the treatment that we were handing out to the, to the locals in these countries. And he wrote about it finally, War is a Racket, which is a wonderful book, a slim book. And that's what he said. I said, I ran more. You see, Alec Capone's a big shot in the gangster world. You know, he runs three counties. I ran about seven countries. I ran, I ran, I ran interference for big business. And he's he very colorful. During the bonus march of 1933, when they uh, when they're in Washington, uh, when they went in, and the veterans from World War One to get paid, they were broke, they were depressed, they had no jobs, they were hopeless army sort of, and uh, Butler helped organize them, 
and made very eloquent demands. They were run out of town by Douglas MacArthur, Doug Patton, and uh, General Eisenhower, who was the aide to MacArthur, but they were run out. And that was the first instance of American troops fighting each other on our own home ground since the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, business, uh, you know, we can go on and on about business. The, the New Deal itself is a very interesting thing to me because after the New Deal, I mean, there was a tremendous surge, and then about 1943, right around Stalingrad time, 44, we start to get more conservative. All these businessmen that are running the country that are having this basically good ride, they don't, they don't really have to compete, right? They're being mm -hmm. guaranteed. Right. And the labor strikes are coming. They decide, they don't, they're worried about the Depression coming back on. So there's this mm -hmm. movement. It's a very subtle movement. They get rid of Henry Wallace, for example. The conservative Democrats are all big business guys. And they, they work their way back to that 46, 47, 48 period, which is crucial in American history. That's when they get the power back. Mm -hmm. That 46th Congress, they get back in. Republicans, they want to destroy the New Deal. They hate the New Deal. 48, Nixon was, came in and hated the New Deal. All those people wanted to get rid of it. And you see that mentality working to real, Eisenhower is one of the, although he maintained some of it, was certainly against it and was influenced heavily by big businesses. You know, we became, in the 1950s, if you grew up there, and we became much more corporate. And a single of it was on television, and you started to see Ronald Reagan selling uh, General Electric, you know. We, everybody was a pitch man for corporations. Uh, started very clear, the country, uh, the legislation under Eisenhower, it wasn't so, it was anti-New Deal. And then it finally culminated with uh, Reagan in 1980, and he was an avowed anti-New Dealer. And that's what, that's what we've seen in this country. We have not seen progressive legislation since the 1930s. And that's it's right. It's funny because World War II, we won it, and we're supposed to have been the the big the big hero. But we took that the fruits of victory, and instead of sharing it with the world, and we did the Marshall Plan. That's true, but of course, most of that money flowed back to us. Mm -hmm. But we didn't help Russia. Roosevelt had made it the very important promised to Stalin that reparations would be sent his way. Along with England, he'd get equal 50-50 on a $20 billion reparations deal. The moment Truman got into office, he, he not only that, he brought back the, 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 the Lend-Lease ships that were going to, to Russia. He brought them back. He didn't want them to have anything. So as I, as I look at all that, though, <laughs> I, I'm worried that FDR was the exception and that... And Kennedy. And, and, and so money wa washes over us <laughs> and and it comes in tides, powerful tides, right? And so I'm worried about our ability to win in the long run, right? Yeah. So from time to time, we get a short burst with Kennedy, we get a very long burst with, with uh, Roosevelt, and, and FDR sets it such good rules in motion that it actually lasts for about 40 to 50 years before the Supreme Court says, no, you're allowed to put money in politics and money is speech and you can spend unlimited money, et cetera. And then, we, and then a wide scale assault on our democracy begins again. But as I look at that, I was growing up, I thought maybe that, that, that we had solved it, that democracy could work, right? Yeah. But then here comes this giant <laughs> tide of money again. So do you get discouraged as you're looking at our history? And I do, and I get, but I also have, uh, as we said in chapter 10, the history has shown us that the curve of the ball can break differently. Uh, every time you think you know what's gonna happen, it doesn't happen that way, you know? Who, who could have predicted that Khrushchev and Kennedy might have made a deal, that they, I mean, that they called off this war? I mean, I do think the world should have ended in 1962, honestly. I think. Uh, and it's been substantiated now by even by this establishment historian Dalek has written a new book on Kennedy where you know he makes the point of how vicious our military Pentagon was by 1960. It got built up by by Truman. It started this national security state, but Eisenhower from 52 to 50 to 60 built it up to from uh, 3,000 nuclear weapons to 23,000, and then he went to 30,000 on the budgeting cycle. We were armed to the teeth, and it was a first option. In other words, Eisenhower had said, let's try to use nuclear weapons as a first strike thing so that it doesn't become, we don't have to get into wars. People will be terrified of us. We had so much superiority over the Soviets that when jo young John Kennedy comes into office, he's facing a mountain. I mean, you have no idea of the odds, and the, the generals are openly disrespectful of him, and we've, you can see that in this establishment book by Dalek. But they, they're, they're undercutting him at every chance they get, from the Bay of Pigs to Laos to Vietnam, and of course, in Cuba. And Cuba is a big, big no-no. For Kennedy's not stupid, he has character, he fights them. And he fights them from day one. It's not like the last year only, he fights. 
and it's a losing battle in the end, but he did get us out of a horrible moment in time when we were, s we really knew we could win. We, we could wipe out the Soviet Union and we could, we could w sustain their, their, uh, their uh, reaction. In other words, we could take that loss. That's what the Dr. Strangelove thing is about. How many casualties do you have to take? Mm -hmm. Nick's, uh, Kennedy thought he was, they were nuts. Mm -hmm. but they had that thought in mind because their thought was, if we don't do it now, they're gonna build. They're gonna, get, they're gonna, and they did. They built, after the, the uh, Cuban crisis, they, uh, they went up to parity practically in the 70s. This is why Reagan was going on so much about we're weak now, although we were building more than they were still. Uh, the point is that uh, I'm trying to make is that fear and paranoia really launch us into these buildups, but we had reached a place in 1962 when it was the end of the world. They're saying, well, take them now. Take them now. We can withstand a, def uh, a retaliation, which is the same attitude we have now because if you look very closely at the map, we have, what is it, 7,000 weapons. Uh, the, the Soviets have eight, but they're not as precise as ours. We're all over the place. We're, our NATO, on, on uh, the deal we cut with, the, the Bush cut a deal with Gorbachev, and of course, uh, Clinton and Bush, the son, broke it. But mm -hmm. NATO has expanded right to the borders of Russia. And we keep talking in the newspapers about how we have to, how the Soviets are trying to peel back uh, s to get back some of their alliances with these border, border countries. Now that the Russians. That was the point of right. what Stalin and Roosevelt were talking about. Stalin wanted border security for the Soviet Union, and he, and he deserved it. He'd fought a huge war to get it. Mm -hmm. Now we're taking back those countries to us, to our side, NATO. And what do we put in NATO, in the NATO countries? A big thing is, of course, the anti the anti-missile, uh, what do they call it uh, these days, you know, to uh, knock down any Soviet missile. So we want, basically, we're looking for, and I think we do have a first strike, we have a first strike ability and we could wipe them out. Now, whether we do or not, that depends. If it's not Obama, maybe it's going to be some other president like Bush who's going to come along, who's going to be a little bit more of a tin horn. You know, it's a scary so, world. So it, it's, it, Obama and JFK are an, are an interesting contrast because as you see JFK stand up to the military in Cuba and say, no, we're not going to do that. I was thinking of uh, President Obama and how he largely has not stood up to the military in the same way. So he comes in and says, in the beginning, we're not going to do signature strikes on drone strikes, right? Uh, the signature strikes are where we literally have no idea who we're bombing, right? We think maybe there's some activity down there. Uh, Robert Greenwald has a new movie coming out, and, and it shows, yeah. and the New York Times wrote about it the other day, 68-year-old yeah. grandmother right. picking I vegetables. Saw it. I saw it. I saw it. Right. And, but at some point, Obama gives in and says, yep, okay, go ahead, go for it. Do signature yeah. strikes, do them in yeah. Yemen, do them in Pakistan, yeah. do them wherever you like. Yeah. So is it just that he has weaker character than Kennedy? Uh, what no. is it? Is no, stronger think, establishment? Think, what, what is it? Yeah, he's stronger establishment. I think that he made a deal somewhere along the line. He understood the situation. If you're a single, f you know, if you're a president, you have military people and security people always around you. They focus you. Your, your life is under threat. Our country's under threat. You're always under threat. You have mm -hmm. to start thinking along these lines, protection, security, because that's a no, it's, that's a, you can't argue that issue in politics. You can't win uh, to lessen your protection. Mm -hmm. So, but it's more than the, the drones. It's really a, we have full spectrum dominance. Obama is in charge of an empire that is beyond the means of anyone has ever seen before, beyond Britain, beyond Rome. We have the, we're everywhere. He talked about cutting infantry strength back and this back, minor stuff. We have lily pads all over the world. They'll jump off spots from Diego Garcia to all over the Pacific Ocean, ringing China. He's declared himself an Asia pivot. We have NATO all on the borders of Russia. We have surveillance from the, s from the space with possibility of drones from space coming up. And we have cyber warfare, a major cyber warfare program. We have s uh, air, sea, and space, uh, air, sea, and land uh, uh, dominance, total dominance. We are armed to the teeth. We have 10 times the budget of China, and yet we're, we're talking about China as a threat, which is why we, we need have a to threat? do the Axis pivot. And Russia still, we have all these, as I said, these, these bases ringing Russia. This is a world that's gone mad. We have dominance, and what's scary is that, of course, we know we can s attack and get away with it. We know we can attack and get away with it. It's, we're at that position where if we start to go down, or if some other empire starts to form and get economically like China, I mean, they're not interested, I don't think, in military aggression. I think they're interested mm -hmm. in economic. Uh, they want to dominate their people, but they also want to have 
they want to have prosperity. They believe in prosperity. They know prosperity worked for America in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and it's up to now, more or less. So uh, I, I, the United States is the primary military threat to the world. And with these new weapons, uh, you know, just imagine George W. Bush visiting us again, you know, or mm -hmm. worse. And it could happen, but you know, the, or the another terrorist strike in this country, or some right. lunatic. Uh, but I, you know, I don't. People often talk about. It. Can you imagine if another Republican got in office? But I, I can. I already have Obama in office. Yeah, yeah, it's so good. it's, you know, it's not that much different. Can uh, you get another Roosevelt in, or a Kennedy, somebody who might disengage? With, that's the with real nobility question. With and so, so let me ask you that. Given that, I I in some ways. We were more progressive domestically in the 40s, 50s, 60s, right? Almost unquestionably. A abroad, though, we were doing coups and we were massively conservative, right wing, et cetera, right? Now, um, and, and history is nuanced, and some of that has gone leftward, some of it has gone rightward. But one thing is clear money in politics has, if anything, grown, grown stronger, more systematic more systemic. So the corruption is used to be, hey, I'll give you money or I'll give you a job. Now, you can't get elected unless you take donor money, unless you right. take money from corporations, right. you take the PAC money, you take the special interest money. So they have found a way to change the rules so that no one can win unless they have taken a giant amount of legalized bribes. Yeah. So we got the change candidate, the hope candidate, it was Obama, and things didn't change. So then is there hope that under this system that you could possibly get an FDR? Uh, <laughs> well, as I, the curve of the ball could break differently. If we have a massive economic uh, tsunami, something of that nature happens, or something happens in the world, and we suck our resources into another stu futile, incredibly expensive war, if the weather changes, I mean, there's things that happen that we haven't thought about. Whoever predicted the Berlin Wall would go down peacefully, that Gorbachev would see the madness of this race and say, enough, it doesn't work for our economy. It's not gonna work for our economy either. I have a feeling that we are really fucking ourselves in, in a deep way. I just, I think it's gonna come from within. It always does. Empires always fall from within. The character, the, the economics, the expense, the waste, the, as you described, the waste, the politics, and you know, little things like this, not little things, but the government shutdown is, is an endemic of this, of this, something's gone wrong. We're, we're too powerful, we're too, we have too many steroids, we're too like this, and we're all yelling at each other. And I sense that, you know, you know about gerrymandering, I don't have to go into that. It seems like a white supremacy thing is going on a bit, like mm -hmm. all these white Republicans are being, are so angry because they know they're going to lose to the to the blacks and the, and the Mexicans and the Asians who are coming into the country. So there's this keep them out and fix the elections, rig the elections, and I think that's what's going on in all these. We wouldn't have had this Congress. We, uh, Obama won by what a million and a half votes. That was enough mm -hmm. to get a good Congress, but it, he got a Republican Congress because of the gerrymandering. I'm told. Th that's right. Uh, the Democrats actually got more votes in the House. Uh, than the Republicans did, but because of the gerrymandering, the Republicans won more seats. It reminds me of the corruption of the Ro Roman Republic. Every, if I read, if you read Michael Parenti's stuff about all the senators and how corrupt they were, including Cicero was one of the most corrupt, mm -hmm. and how Julius Caesar really tried to change it, at the, was one of the last ones to try to change that system, and got 44 ni knife wounds in the back, I think. Yeah, that's usually how history goes. To which As did Kennedy. <laughs> well, that's exactly <laughs> right, and that's exactly where I was going to circle back to, because so I another thing I got from watching the untold history is you see the CIA doing all these different gov uh, regime change, uh, you know, is a way of putting it, right? Or intervention. In, yeah, in, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Latin America, sometimes outright coups, sometimes more subtle Just than that. money into elections, you know, right. France, Italy, after the war. Right. And uh, you know, 1953 in, in Iran it was pivotal, changed yeah. world history yeah. by toppling their democracy, so we can uh, you know get their oil uh, at you know at more right. favorable prices right. for business interests, yeah. not American interests. Right. The American people never got that oil. Right. Uh, you know, the American companies got it, and now those companies are no longer American anyway. They're multinational corporations. Right. They we've built these giant robots, et cetera. But as I saw all that happening at that period of history, then you see JFK, Martin Luther King, uh, and, and Robert Kennedy all killed. 
And I think, so you're telling me the, the CIA that did this abroad on a regular basis yeah. couldn't possibly do it at, at home? No, uh, no, I think we made that point in the JFK movie in 1991 that they were trained for that. Fletcher Prouty was talking to me about, they were, we did this abroad, we did it very well. Uh, we always were, uh, we kept our hands, our Indonesian efforts uh, were not known. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think it was Rostauer Bundy said that, you know, we should have stopped in Indonesia because we succeeded so much in 65. And it looked like the communists had started it and we had, it was, we, I think a million communists were slaughtered, you know. Mm -hmm. It was a tremendous coup inside. They all knew about it. No one knew about it. But they were all talking about Vietnam at that point. And uh, Bundy made the point, and he was a hawk. We should have stopped in Indonesia because that was where the riches are. It's much richer than Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Interesting point, but uh, in other words, we were getting away with it. But I think Greece is much more, uh, Greece 1947-9 is a very crucial first intervention. Because that's where Truman makes his Truman Doctrine. That's where he sends uh, $400 million to Greece and Turkey. And he sends the first non-combat advisors. All of this to replace the British uh, effort to keep Greece going. Mm -hmm. Greece had invaded, uh, Britain had invaded uh, Athens in 1944 after the communists had liberated, the, uh, from the, liberated Greece from the, Nazi, from the Nazis. They, mm -hmm. went, they dive bombed the streets of Athens. Churchill it was a big deal for him, Greece, because that was the linchpin to the, to the Middle East as well as to the far, far East. So getting Greece back was a major issue for Churchill. And when he faltered in the winter of 46-7, the U.S. went in there. And that was, that was the biggest first commitment. That was the first signal of really this was a Cold War that was going on after the atomic bomb. So as I see the CIA do decapitation strikes basically on the leaders of those other countries, whether it's Iran, Latin America, Greece, w whatever it might be. Guatemala was a big deal. Yeah. Um, and I see that the three most progressive leaders that America had that stood up for the American people yeah. also, in a sense, get decapitated. And uh, almost literally, right? Who are the three you're thinking of? Uh, oh, you're talking about oh, that? JFK, yeah, RFK, I, don't, I can't say Martin about Martin Luther King because I don't know that the CIA was involved in that. I think that there was a tremendous amount of racism that he was up against as well as he went against the Vietnam War. So he hit on the three, the three monsters, racism, poverty, he went the war on poverty, and uh, uh, militarism. Well, you see, that's the thing. When he took on race, he wasn't killed no. yet, right? Yet. And poverty, Although, et cetera. Yeah. But when he uh, w went up against the war, he gets assassinated, yeah. right? And so, look, I don't know. I don't know what happened. Of course, you know, no one has a definitive word on it. But it, it just opened my eyes well, a little bit to how possible yeah. it was see, that I it was we, some we, portion of yeah. our government. But I just don't go all, I know, I'm, I'm not the, I, I wouldn't go there yet. I would say that with the autopsy and ballistic evidence with Kennedy, no question, no question that there were two shooters at the least, mm -hmm. and it, more than that. But it's also with the Robert Kennedy case, the autopsy and the bullets, and the, the amount of shots heard, the eyewitnesses, it's still amazing to me that we could fall for that bullshit about Sirhan Sirhan. Yeah. Who doesn't, I don't even know, hit him as far as I know. It wasn't, he was in front of him, but anyway, look. so. In the Robert Kennedy case, that's a still to be gone. I think a, a good filmmaker can get in there and, and do a great story. But JFK, I, I just cannot, I cannot stand reading uh, establishment uh, press saying that, of course, uh, Oswald is the assassin. You know, they, without, they haven't read a book. They haven't even consulted an expert who's really worked at this for 30 years. So, there's so many of them that are available. They don't, they don't take it seriously. It's, that's, what's, that's the arrogance of America. That's our blindness. That's a truly, we are, if you read our media today, and I don't know how, about how disturbed you get about it, we always assume whenever a situation arises that we have to solve it, that we're in charge, that it's, what is America's interest here? How, whether it's uh, Fuji or Fiji or, uh, you know, somewhere in Afghanistan. And it's a strange mentality, a mindset that's come into being in the arrogance of World War II. It's never left us. And I thought a black man might have a different take on it. I would, and I certainly Martin Luther King did, and he, sh but Obama doesn't live up to that man's character. Uh, uh, King was a religious man. He heard it from within. He said, "The call of the voice of God is on me." He said that. You know. Mm -hmm. he, now you might think he's nuts. He's talking to God, but you know that's what black preachers had. They had that thing, and they, he said, "I got to do what's right. It's in my conscience." And he declared war on the U.S. for this, for declaring war on Vietnam because they were fighting colored people over there too. Right. You know, I remember uh, watching Martin Luther King's speeches as a really y young yeah. kid and, and being unbelievably moved by them. 
and I'm agnostic, but even now when I listen to Martin Luther King's speeches, yeah. and I have a Good CD speech. of them, and yeah. I listen to them every once in a while in the car, and uh, and when he talks about Jesus, I love that uh -huh. Jesus. <laughs> you know, whether I believe that he right. existed or yeah. not, I, I want him, like that's the Jesus I want to exist, yeah. Yeah. right? Sure. That cared about the poor, the needy, yeah. and, and, and all of us, that yeah. wanted to bring us together, not set us apart. Right. But they've kidnapped that Jesus, sure. you know, and, and they've used them for corporate purposes. You know, they've corporatized Jesus, yeah. as they have with war and, and, and everything else. Department of Defense, right? It's, it's a joke, as, as we know. I mean, if, if we were actually defending the country, sign me up, right? But when's the last time we, fell, we did a defensive war rather than offensive war? No, we, we've been fighting offensive wars since, since, since Korea on. So, so it's, it, it's a fascinating history. It's the untold history of the United States. Whether you get it in paperback or you get it in Blu-ray that's out now, as, and I watched it uh, all 12 parts, uh, and now there's a prologue as we've been talking about here, uh, you've got to check it out. Uh, Please uh, do. <laughs> you know, and I say that not because, you, you know me, I, I've interviewed a, a million people and I, I don't play favorites, etc. When I say it, I mean it. I watched the whole thing and I wanted more. You know. Thank you. And uh, now, of course, you can't do an epilogue yet. <laughs> okay, We're, so we'll we'll get back to that maybe yeah. after Obama's second term. Curve the ball. Curve the ball. No, I, you know, and the thing is, I'm not sure I agree though. That's that's the, yeah. uh, you know, as I watch it, I think yes, there are some moments uh, like the the convention where Truman is picked as vice president yeah. instead of Wallace. Yes, curve the ball. It could have gone differently, yeah. and and yes, that led to. A certain set of consequences that were monumentally important in American history. Yeah. Uh, or let's say uh, Stalin dies in '53. Eisenhower is the incoming new president. You know, here's mm -hmm. a chance for detente. All, he's offered the olive branch by the uh, new Soviet leaders. Doesn't take it. John Foster but, Dulles is his uh, uh, Secretary of State. It takes a wholly hostile attitude, roll back, brinksmanship with the Soviet Union. Don't forget uh, uh, John Kennedy. He was starting to, and then oh, he meets Dallas, and the, his head is blown off at high noon. No, but see, those I don't think are curve of the ball, to be honest with you, because I think Eisenhower was going to make that decision. He was selected, he was elected I to see. make that decision, okay? And I think uh, JFK, unfortunately, met Dallas because of the decisions that he made. So if he had played ball, JFK, and he had done what the oh, yeah. ge generals he wanted, he really doesn't meet Dallas, nope. right? And so, so that, but but at the same time, there's the wobbly chair. The assassin goes to assassinate FDR. And don't forget, he fired Mr. Dulles, who was the head of the CIA. That's very important too, and very emotional issue. Mm -hmm. He fired Alan Dulles after right. the Bay of Pigs, and so you have a unemployed yes. CIA head running around Washington who's very respected. Yeah, and to me, the, another p part of what people I think misunderstand is when they s think the government did it, they think that the whole government yeah, yeah. got together yeah. and, uh, so and made a decision. So no, it's. There's certain branches. Dulles wasn't even in the government at that point. That's outside. right. But by the way, you were saying, well, we keep going with your theme. theme. I want to hear your. The so okay. the wobbly chair. FDR gets elected, and it, you know, and at that point, if he the assassin comes to to kill him, but the his literally his chair wobbles as he's shooting, and right. and he misses, and he hits the Chicago mayor and kills oh, him instead. Miami, right. 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 So now, if FDR is killed right then and there, right, then we never go in the progressive direction. Right, uh, and so yes, the curve of the ball. Yes, sometimes you get the wobbly chair. Yeah. Sometimes okay. Truman is picked instead of Wallace. But the system tries to eliminate that as much as possible. So it, it's headed in a, the train is headed in a certain direction. Right. Sometimes we can veer it in the right direction. Right. Like for for example, now I my main driving. Uh, force is that we've got to get the money out of politics. We've got yeah. to end corporate personhood. We've got to finance elections publicly. If we, if we do that, then we set the train in the right direction as opposed to the wrong direction. But, uh, and we don't have to wait for luck. You have we to don't be Superman, no? What about the Vietnamese? I mean, whoever counted that Ho Chi Minh and his little group of Vietnamese, General Jap, and those people would actually beat our empire after we dropped more bombs on Vietnam than any his, uh, that we did in all of World War II. But again, there I would that one? That's a curve of the ball. I, I, no, I, I don't think so. Because I think if it wasn't Vietnam, it was going to be somewhere else. Yes, we might have crushed the Vietnamese, but eventually we were going to run into a country where they did not bend. But that's what they did. That We did crush them and they didn't bend. No, no, that's what I'm saying. It out. happened to be that we met our fate in Vietnam. But if we hadn't, we would have met it somewhere else. We met it later in, a, in Iraq. Uh, that's with, right. With the insurgency. We met it in Afghanistan. Because when you're full of hubris, yeah. at some point, 
you run into a people that will not bend. That's what I meant by the curve of the ball. Whoever figured on Gorbachev? Whoever figured on Gore, f that freaky 2000 election? Gore won. And whatever the, uh, whoever says what, I, I, in my soul, I believe that was a cursed moment for the U.S. In 2000, the concept of a, the date, the number, the 21st century was beginning, and we start this way. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, that? why, that's why I love history. That's why I love history. Because right there. That was so, a curve of the ball. No, Florida. that was a curve. But, but, but actually, that goes towards both of our theories. Because it was and it wasn't. Let me explain what I mean by that. The forces uh, that are on the side of, you know, corporate interests, et cetera, et cetera. Pick the guy like Roger Ailes, who was Nixon's man in terms of the <laughs> press and communications, who was with Ronald Reagan, who was with George H.W. Bush, and he goes to head News Corp, uh, or I should say Fox News, that's part of News Corp. The devil. Right, and, and Fox News, on that fateful night, is the first network to say George Bush won the state of Florida, mm. when in fact he had not won the state of Florida. I see. And the person that Roger Ailes t selected to head their election department, to call the election, was George W. Bush's cousin, first mm -hmm. cousin. Mm -hmm. So they had actually set that train in motion. Yeah, okay. It was not an accident. But they had to get now, now, at the same time, it was an accident of fate that Florida happened to be so close that it was a statistical tie, that the other networks were confused. That's when Ailes steps in and says, Bush is the winner. Bush is the winner, and the other networks panic. Right. And they go, oh my God, somebody called it. We're late, we're late, we're late. Sounds okay. like a curve of the ball to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, my point is, you needed the curve of the ball and the train at the same time. Because Ailes set that in motion so that if it was close, right. that he would have Bush's cousin call the election. Right. It worked out perfectly for him. Right. It was close. Bush's cousin called the election. It set That set into motion the other networks panicking and calling the election for Bush, which set in motion the idea that Bush was the rightful winner, even though when they counted the votes afterwards, Gore won every single recount in the state but of Florida. I, Roger Ailes is not going to prevent an economic tsunami from hitting the United States, no matter what he says on television, any more than Karl Rove That's true. could call uh, Mitt Romney the winner in Ohio. So now we get to the final uh, which this is the real epilogue, and, and it's yet to be written. Okay, which is they've g when that economic collapse happens, and it is going to happen because there's nothing, as you say, there's nothing Ailes can do, there's nothing any of them can do to stop 1.2 quadrillion dollars worth of derivatives from blowing up. <laughs> That's what it is. I didn't even know what a quadrillion was. I had to look it up. It's a thousand trillion. Okay, the, and there is 1.2 quadrillion worth of derivatives bets. That is a time bomb. It's a financial time bomb that will explode. There is no question about it. And when it does, the ales of the world have set a train to come by and say, it was the liberals who did it. Mm -hmm. And get on board, we gotta go further right. Mm -hmm. it the free market would have solved this, but they overregulated. Mm -hmm. they messed with the free market. The poor banks, they shouldn't have done it to the banks, and it was the government that did it, it was the government that did it. When in reality, it was the deregulation that did it, right? right? So at that moment, after the collapse, there will be a pivotal curveball. Right. And will we go left, will we go right, will we go towards the path of justice, or will we go towards the path of moneyed interest again. And, and that's yet to be decided. And that's why right. all of this yeah. is, is that's fascinating. That's why we're hanging around. At least I'm older than you. I'm hanging around <laughs> to see what's going to happen. I'm, I'm a dramatist by, uh, by trade, and so tension is what interests me. The tension of not knowing. Right. You know? And I love it. When you read the newspapers and you see the TV, they always know they're smug. And I always fight that smugness because right. I don't know. Yeah, and, and we don't know what's going to happen at that moment. And my sense of it is they got a train coming to take people up and send them to a right-wing, <laughs> uh, you know, dys dystopia. Uh, well and what I want to do we can, is, you and I can, uh, what I want to do is, I want to throw them a curveball. And at that pivotal moment, say, no, 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 we're going to go back in the direction of FDR. And we're going to set this thing right, and yes, money will t bring in another tsunami at a later date. But we can set it right for maybe 10 years, 20 years, if we're lucky, 50 years. And we can bring the country back in the right direction. That's what we have to be ready for. Well, listen, China and Japan are, are, are giving us a lot of credit. Why don't we uh, get, be get along with them a little bit better? Why don't we make an effort with China to really... Uh, the, the because they, we need a boogeyman. 
Uh, and well, that's, that, you know, this is, is that, is that the age-old paranoia that's ingrained in us that we cannot get rid of? Because there's always these hardcore right-wingers that say that no matter who's coming up, Albania is the next enemy or Kosovo or whatever. Well, that's half of it, I that's think. Your, where you're from. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, the Turks are always the enemy. <laughs> All across the world, in the history of the world, the Turks are always the enemy. But uh, the Turks are always coming, right? <laughs> but half of it is you need an enemy for psychological reasons. The other half is the military, industrial complex, et cetera, needs an enemy one way or another, yeah. otherwise we would stop producing all those we lovely weapons that they're producing. Yeah. And they, they need to get paid. Yes. So, and that's part of why we do the drone strikes, not because we want to be safer, but because we know they're counterproductive. Or at least some people, not the entire government, not necessarily Obama, but some people realize how counterproductive they are, and they think, great, that'll create more hostility yeah. and we'll get paid even more. So that's my take on it, obviously, history uh, uh, will decide, right? <laughs> the, in the well, it's beyond us. The truth has a mind of its own. You know? Right. All right, but you've, everybody, you've got to check out Untold History of the United States. It gives you context and framing for where we are today, having seen what's happened in the past. Oliver Stone, thank, thank you so you, much for joining us. Really appreciate Please. it. Thank you.